This just in, Arsenal have actually lost 2-0 to Manchester City, as someone sitting in a van in Milwaukee has decided to chalk off our goal. This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast. My name is Alex Smith, you me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Yeah, sad news. I mean, 2-1, obviously not the result we were looking for, but 2-0, I think that makes it a little more painful. But unfortunately, <clears throat> um, for reasons that have not been explained and will never be explained, someone in a van thousands of miles away has chalked off our, our goal, so sorry to hear that. No, I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. That is obviously a thing we're going to be discussing. Happy New Year to you. I hope you had a wonderful uh, New Year's Eve celebration if you were celebrating or just a, a great New Year's Eve trying to make it till midnight, which if you're a parent, you uh, you know where I'm at with that. I am at present uh, in Florida visiting my parents with my wife and two children. So uh, there is a pool and fruity uh, beverages that may have some level of alcohol in them beckoning to me outside the door of where I am now. But But you know what? This comes first. Arsenal comes first. You come first. And I'm happy to be here to discuss... <clears throat> what I hope will be a positive moment for all of us as fans once we get past the clear injustice uh, of how the result came to light. And it is unfortunate because the, the results outside of the Arsenal game were not great either. So it's a lot to discuss, a lot to unpack, but I have the best in the business here to do it with me. By the way, um, Tim, also on holiday in Brazil, not here today. He was on the Instant Reaction. That was a very emotional affair. A very fiery Clive is on Twitter, at Clive PAFC. Clive, it's good to speak to you, and uh, I'm wondering if you are still breathing fire as you were in that moment. Uh, hello, hello. Um, I've thought about things, and I feel exactly the same. The, the volume may be slightly different, but um, hey, I'm looking forward to discussing yeah, I, I I enjoyed you bringing the heat, that's for sure. Uh, turns out that rich baritone can go up just a slight titch when uh, when the emotions are hot. Uh, Paul is here as well. You can find him on Twitter. Pause my pants. Hello, pause. Woo-hoo. No? Yeah, oh, okay. There you are. Uh, how are you doing, pause? Good. Is there a lag or a delay or something? Uh, yeah, but you know what? We'll uh, we'll have to figure that out as we go. The good news is that our special fancy software, I think, stitches that <laughs> together. But you are hearing me. That's the important thing. I am, yeah. Woo. Okay, good. Woohoo, indeed. Uh, okay, so, um, well, Clive, I, I want to I wanna make something clear. I think that the best use of this podcast is to try to discuss, analyze, celebrate, break down why we played so well, how we played so well, what it means going forward, the performances that inspired. Because, you know, on the instant reaction, I took a bit of a counterintuitive position, which will shock nobody. But I I wasn't in the mood, partly because I'm on vacation, to (laughs) rage against the refereeing, but only because I was very much in the mood to celebrate the performance. And what I was trying to articulate is what I've seen on social media, in our Discord, on the Twitter, in blogs and things, which is, you know, and even on match of the day type videos and things like that, which is so much of the analysis now is about the refereeing, which deprives us of what should be a fun opportunity to discuss a performance as good as any we've seen in years that, granted, was was robbed of us uh, results-wise by the referee. So I understand the duality there, and I hope that we will focus on what we did right rather than what the referees did wrong. But we have to start there because it is such a talking point. I, I think here's where I've come down on it. The crux of this entire debate comes down to them getting the penalty because we do not get a penalty that I think is a penalty, but it's close enough that it's not an outrage not to get it. The penalty they get, in my view, is not a penalty, but again, close enough. I think you either have to give both or not give both. And VAR's intervention there to give that not only leads to that, but because Gabriel is carded in the in the wake of the penalty award for you know his reaction that then also leads to the sending off later and so that that for me the whole crux of it if that penalty isn't given we keep the lead gabriel stays on the pitch and we're not talking about the referees but overall there's so much there because there's the not carding city for the rotational fouling i think we had five cards on seven tackles or something like that so where is the locus of the problem with the refereeing for you and for me, it's the word I use is game management. Right? So I felt the referee was managing that game absolutely fine until he was forced to go and do the VAR thing. Right? So and when and when he done that, then what comes happens after that is all about him and how he manages the moments after that and manages the emotion that's going around that stage. And I wasn't able to be at this game because I've just come out of COVID. So I've literally just gone negative today. So I'm back in the room. So basically, I wasn't able to go to this game. And But just from listening to it, you can 
hear that the whole ground was going mental. And so the players and everybody takes their trigger from that. Right? So, and within the penalty decision, there was a bit that I didn't really realise the impact until I rewatched it, was that for some reason, the football club put the incident on the screen, which they never do. They never do it. Anything controversial, you never get a replay. And that re-triggered things and re-triggered things and created an atmosphere where this weak personality referee had to manage the game. And the way he chose to do it was not smart. You know, and he was antagonised. He lost his patience. Our players lost their patience continually. And we ended up in a situation within about a three, four-minute period where our lives changed. (laughs) Literally, that's how it felt to me. Everything changed from a game that we were in a form of control over, competing really well in, but the ability and inability of the referee to manage the emotion of the game and the way he chose to do it was a dismissive way. And it really started from the start of the second half. I know Paul does these events really, really well. There was a big tackle on Martinelli, which the players were angry about. And it ended up as a corner. And people were just dumbfounded. And everything else continued from there. The injustice continued from there in their eyes. And so for the players, although we look at them and say, oh, you've got to make yourself better in this instant. But for them, it's a continual death by a thousand cuts type thing. And they just exploded. They couldn't hold it. And there are moments when you hope certain players would try to lead. But in the end, it's an emotional thing, right? It's a big game. They were playing really well. And they felt it was being taken away from them. And I couldn't say I disagreed with them, right? But you, you could, I could see it and say, oh, you know what? He's been mature. But no, I didn't. I wasn't mature in instant reaction, right? And I wasn't even playing. Right? So it's just sometimes football gets you and, and it got our players. And we didn't, we got maximum punishment for it. But for me, the instants, we'll always argue about instants. But how you manage a game, that's a constant. That is a constant. And the referee, did not manage that game as well as he could have done, in my opinion. Yeah, and I mean, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to credit the players again, because look at how mental all of us are going on social media, on podcasts, in our conversations, in in our just personal reactions. Now imagine you're one of the players on the pitch who fought and bled and and ran till your lungs are bursting and played out of your skin to take a lead against the champions of England and maybe the best team in the world. And you're having it taken from you by the refs and to maintain your composure and try to stay in the game mentally. <clears throat> and I think even when we went down to 10 men, play well, play your football. I think they showed a lot of character, but Paul, I think there's just a truism here that we can agree upon. I think there's one central universal truth here, which is that in general men in dodgy vans are a problem <laughs> wherever you are, whatever you're doing. If there's a man in a dodgy van somewhere, avoid him. You probably don't want to go near him in a Walmart parking lot, and you probably don't want him refereeing your football match. And, you know, I have always been in favor of VAR, but I think P- Clive has hit on something really important, which is that the man in the dodgy van, you know, not at the ground and not in the moment, is making a calculation about something that does not have context. And so I, while I think that calls should be calls based on, you know, the laws of the game, I do think that refereeing has to take context into account because giving a penalty, which is basically giving a goal, or giving a red card, which is basically spoiling a game, in low scoring in a low-scoring sport just affects it so much. And the guy who has been keeping his cards in his pocket or letting them play has to be the guy deciding on these key moments, not a man in a dodgy van. So would you agree with me, Paul, that men in dodgy vans, in general, a big problem? Uh, I would, yeah. And actually, I was actually trying to work out how you were pivoting into a manscaped ad with the way that started. <laughs> like, now, now, let's not despair dodgy v- <laughs> Where is he? I, do, I don't see it. Um, yeah, like the problem with with this whole VAR thing is that we hated the way refereeing was so unfair before, and we had this idea that that VAR and science and technology would feel fairer. Um, and it might even be fairer, but it's so far away from fair. Um, I always liked the idea of VAR for offsides. If you gave me VAR for offsides and referees get to make the calls in the game, um, 
that's kind of my best compromise, but like lots of other people wouldn't be happy with that. Um, and in a sport where most results are um, decided by, on average, just under three goals, when there's two penalty shouts and one is, uh, and they're both, let's say they're equally meritorious, because um, I think that's probably about right. I mean, I'm not 100% sure on either penalty. I'm pretty bloody sure on 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 both penalties, but they gave one, didn't give the other. That's a two-goal swing in a game in which there were three goals, and in most games, the average is three go- goals. That's VAR making the decision on the game, basically, based on which one they gave and which one they didn't. And I think they could have given ours, and the referee could have decided he'd seen enough on his and he'd, he uh, on the on the the Chaka um, call to say that that you know he could have gone the other way. He could have said, "Well, I saw it. I thought it was a dive. I don't think there was enough contact, and I don't think the the shirt pull was was consequential enough and not given that." Um, Overall, I think they're both equally meritorious. I think they're both penalties. Um, and uh, within the range of, uh, of, of difference that you would accept, and they gave one and didn't, and they, pretty, they decided a match, basically. We could have gone 2-0 up instead of 1-1. Um, and I think it was a really, really bad day for consistency. Um, but in the logic of VAR, uh, when they explain it, I kind of get why they did what they did. Um, it's just, it's kind of feels like bullshit yeah. to the customer. L- like if this were a business in which you had customers, the customer would say, this is absolute bullshit. I don't care that you have a logic for it. This just, you know, you're giving us the shaft and... <laughs> Um, like you can have all the reasons in the world for your logic for it, and they do. Um, they screwed the people who watch the sport. Yeah, hey, you know what I think also is is problematic with with VAR in particular. Like there is such a thing as the makeup call in sports. Everybody yeah. knows it, right? You get a harsh call against you, so you get one for you, and like. Even if that's not the true application of the laws, it's the true application of justice. It's the idea that a referee in his discretion can try to make everything feel even over the course of the 90 minutes. So like, I denied a penalty shout for Arsenal that probably was pretty close. I'm not going to give one to City under the same circumstances because that wouldn't be just. And he had half time to look at it at that stage. Right. So he he probably knows. But but then the problem is VAR looks at it and says, oh, but this is a pe-. And like that takes the idea of justice out of it because if you showed me any of the calls in this match and said individually, is that call an outrage? I probably wouldn't say, like, like you know what an outrage is? Robin Van Persie getting sent off at the new camp for shooting after the whistle when 80,000 people are whistling. That is corruption. That is injustice. Like, that, that, to me, is the clearest sense of a wrong decision that is unjust and corrupt. None of these calls individually rise to it, but there's no justice because we got cards and they didn't. They got a penalty and we didn't. They had a man sent off and we didn't. And so what VAR denied us was just the ability for the referee, and to be fair, the referee does make the call after going to the monitor, so let's not take him out of it, to make it just. And then the cherry on top of this shit Sunday is him running deep into the penalty area so that Martinelli has to basically round him and doesn't put it in the open net. And by the way, that's not me excusing Martinelli missing a good chance. It's just me saying he has to adjust his run to get around Atwell, and that makes it just that bit harder, and he gets to it just that bit later. If he puts that in, Gabriel doesn't get sent off. We take the lead. There is no red card. And I do think Atwell influenced that. So it's the sum total for me that feels like injustice. Instead of any one individual call where I'm like, that call is an outrage. And Clive, I, I want to wrap up the discussion of the refereeing by just saying, like, I do I do think that there is no such thing as a fix for this unless you just get better people and better processes in place. Because when you read the excuse making and the justifications and the way the referees explain their job, I, I don't think the problem is the way the game is refereed or the way VAR is used so much as I just think better more professional people need to be in charge of these games. And I, and I think that 
there should be a rethinking, and you said this so well in the instant reaction, about what it means to give a penalty or give a red card. Because those calls completely change the game. That's not to say that you shouldn't give them when they're warranted, but maybe we've reached a point where they are too easy to achieve for a thing that is a, a complete game changer. Yeah, so there are there are rules, there are unwritten rules in the game, right? And and we all have our own unwritten rules. And one of my big things is player safety. So when I see big fouls, like the Mane foul in minute one, and we all see what Mane does in the first minute of a game. We've seen it before. And finally, now the world has seen it, right? So when you do that in a game, something should happen, right? In our game, again, we did it to Ben White. There wasn't even a card. At least there was a card in this game which controlled him, right? So... Those sort of things to me, I'm I'm a little bit harder on, and I care less about who's on the pitch when player safety is under threat. Harry Kane tackle, for example, I don't like that. Right. So, but when I see things in a game which I feel could be managed better to make sure the game is there as a whole, I think referees are quite weak in that situation. Now, whenever I'm involved in non-league, right, one of the things we 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 hate is when we go to a game. The referee's there, and he's got an assessor in the crowd. Because when he has an assessor in the crowd, he's a completely different referee. And it's a worry. We know with bookings, we know with a game we don't recognise. The VAR situation for me really bothers me because I want to know who's in charge. You know, the referee should be in charge of the game. He he made that decision. He knew what he saw. He was very adamant when he waved off the penalty. But he was forced to go and look at it. And as soon as he goes and look at it, we know he's no longer in charge. As a fan, we know who's in charge of that game. And it's not him, it's the guys in the van. And when that happens, you ask yourself as a punter, as a fan, as a distant fan, global fan, whatever you are, a legacy fan, <laughs> wherever you are, we want to know who's in charge of that game. We want to know what we're seeing is real and pure and, and transparent. As soon as that gets questioned, we get angry. And that is how it felt in the ground, and that's how it felt all around the world. And then you're watching something that you're not seeing the, quite the result go as you should. And look, we've, we've lost games unluckily before, and it will happen again. We'll get seasons against us. Then you start to stack things up and say, hold on a minute here. What is going on? You know, what is going on? And once you lose people like that, you lose people. And there's been a real mirror against the referees this weekend, more than I've noticed for a long time. People are questioning the referees. They're questioning the type of people who are still refereeing. I mean, mate, Mike Dean started refereeing when I had an afro and a 32-inch waist, and I don't have either right now. Do you know what I mean? This is a long time ago. And so this guy is still out there, still out there doing this job. And I ask myself a question, why is it such a close shot? Why are the same people making the same decisions from the same basis, from the same rules of the road? They look at people in the same way. They talk to people they can understand in the same language. They're friendly with people they obviously are going to be friendly with are more like them. There are things there that need to be looked at. It needs to be looked at to improve the product. And I don't like using the word product, but it is, it is a product. We were watching something which was wonderful that I felt was taken away. And I, I don't like seeing that. You know, generally, forget it's Arsenal. As a football fan, I don't like seeing games distorted to a point where it's no longer the same game over instance which do not worry, warrant that distortion. You know, and that's where my anger came out in the instant reaction. It wasn't game management. It was just a series of poor decisions by poor quality people that are allowed to keep their jobs continuously with no accountability and ruin days for people. This is starting yeah. to hit too close to home, Clive. <laughs> yeah, ruin days, <laughs> ruin days for people, you know. And I'll get, and we'll all get over it. And there'll be another game, and that's a great thing about football. There's always another game, right? Always another incident, and a, a new transfer comes in, and we'll all be buzzing, right? So, but right now, I think it maybe there's a window in, in our in our thinking about how games are refereed. I hope we have a chance to rewrite some of the unwritten rules that are out there and really look at this root and branch and not before yeah. time, not before time, mate. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because let's say there was no VAR and they, did, we didn't get our penalty and they did. I'd actually probably be more understanding of that only because I think one thing referees do, I think referees are very driven by optics 
they look at situations and they catalog in their mind all the penalties they've given and seen given and all the challenges they've given cards for and not given cards for. And they compare, does this look like that? Does this look like this? Ederson charges out and it looks like he gets the ball. And it looks like a very natural thing for a keeper to do. So he doesn't give the penalty. With VAR, it's clear he gets foot and not ball. It should be a penalty. With Shaka, it's the opposite. Shaka sticks a leg in and pulls a shirt. Now, the way he shapes his body to stick a leg in, optics. The optics of that look like every penalty ever seen given. You can take a still shot with Shaka's leg in and it looks like a pen. But with VAR, you can see that he gets it out of the way in time, that he doesn't actually cause the contact, that it's a dive and it shouldn't be given. And this is what I think is so shitty about these men in dodgy vans is like, if you want to intervene, I can understand the optics of those two things looking the way they did. But the video replay shows the opposite. And that's what's so unfortunate. I think the reason... I don't want to focus on the refereeing any further, though. And the reason why I didn't in the moment, I'd like to think this is where I'm consistent. I've always said that the thing that's important to me is good process. Because if you have good process, eventually, even if it doesn't happen immediately, you'll get a better outcome. Look at our process in the transfer market this summer. A better process, and already we're seeing a better outcome. If you said to me, Elliot, you can have the way we played against City with the outcome we got. Or you could have us get battered against City on New Year's Day and fluke a win on a dodgy penalty. Some of you listening may say, I'll take the fluky win. But that's not where I'm at. I will take this performance every time. Because this performance to me says, something is happening here. Something is happening that makes us a team to be reckoned with. And suddenly the idea that we're fluking wins against weak teams or that we haven't figured it out, this performance to me suggested that maybe we figured it out. And so I want to start to pivot to that, Paul, and say, like, do you at least agree that if you had to choose between a dodgy, lucky win where we played poorly or what we saw on New Year's Day, that despite the refereeing disgraces, there are things in this game, which we will discuss momentarily, that make this the better long-term prospect for us because it shows we can not only play with the best, we can outplay the best, which I think we did for long stretches of this game. Look, I think you always take the points over the performance unless what you're really saying with the performance is that's the level we're at. Um, And in that sense, I fully agree with you. Yeah. Um, You can't come away, like, not just Arsenal supporters, but the pundits, the people out there whose opinions you would read and who matter, uh, if anybody else's opinions matter, and they usually don't, um, say this was different, that Arsenal has grown, Arsenal has progressed. And like the level of football we played for a solid 45 minutes, I mean, we gave them, uh, we gave no quarter defensively. Uh and uh, a- as we built up, everything made sense. It wasn't one of those games where we, uh, the Chelsea game last year, where this it was this heroic Alamo defense where we held in there, but as soon as we got the ball, we basically spilled it or we booted up field or we uh, hoped for a miracle. Um, this was an integrated performance from back to front. And when we, when we got the ball, we knew what we were going to do it with it we knew how to use it we had quality on the ball uh we, our passes stuck we found players it wasn't this all we saw were blue shirts we couldn't find our own guys uh the distribution from the back we mixed it up uh was um ederson-esque uh that that ball to to Martinelli and the take from Martinelli. And then you look at the individual players that are growing. Martinelli was astounding. Like um, on the Sky uh, Premier League or whatever, they do these reruns of games from back in the day and you see Ronaldo at that age and you and you look at the player he became. Now, you shouldn't do comps. Uh, Martinelli won't r- turn into Ronaldo. But you say to yourself, holy shit, if he can just keep progressing, just what he's done in the last few weeks from from when he came into the team and he was raw but effective, and he's just settled down and he start to he's woven into the team, he's integrated, and he's got himself two, three great chances in this game. Um, and you see Saka from the other side, every game he plays, doesn't matter how many city players are surrounding him, 
um, he goes uh, it, it, up to two, three players, kind of weaves and hovers and finds a path through and gets a path, a pass off. It's like these guys are at the level. We've got two weapons from either side. Uh, Lacazette doing a, a man's job in the middle, connecting it. The the midfield, Tom, Thomas Party stepping up after about 20 minutes and putting on a show. Um, the midfield, coherent, sensible, balanced. The midfields look good even when the players haven't been great. Before Party and before Chaka kind of hit this uh, vein of form where one of them has a good game and the other one kind of supports them. Um, the midfield has worked um, despite them not being in their best form and just it all held together and they couldn't get down our sides. Tommy Yasu, Tierney, the centre held. The, the chill on the ball at the back with Ben White passing out to Tommy Yasu or into midfield. Um, and then n- not doing anything too stupid either way. Not Not playing out to a fault from the back, not going long all the time. It was just a really well-balanced day with the crowd behind them. That first half was absolutely brilliant. And we started the second half well, and we kind of talked about how it kind of began to come apart. And uh, I just think, as we've seen in this season, we need to keep growing because we did, if we do what we did for the first 50 minutes and we keep that going to 60, 70 minutes in this game, you have it to the point where we can and should win it. I think we were always going to, it was always going to get a bit ragged against City as as we got a little tireder. Like, we haven't learned to do this for 90 minutes, but we have gone from playing 10, 15 minutes of really good football to complete halves, starting the second half well. Uh, like, we just never backed off against these guys. We didn't say, oh, well, that was good. Let's hold on to what we've got now for as long as we can. We, we decided we could go toe-to-toe to them with them and if we'd kept a little more chill um and grown and i think we will so uh, to your point i would take the performance the mentality it's not just the the level we can play it's the level we did play the mentality the quality we maintained at all times and that's not something we've seen for years that against a team like this we would have quality when we got on the ball and didn't just kind of hoof it or spill it or yeah. end up kind of back defending again. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that impressed me. I mean, first of all, the fact that we were even willing to try to press City and that it worked and that we were able to control the game such that they didn't have a shot on target, I don't believe, in the first half. And Clive, one of the players that I, I think needs to be called out immediately for this performance is Thomas Party because... There's two things that are needed in order to outplay a team like Manchester City, in order to be a title contender, in order to be a Champions League contender. The collective has to be brilliant. The game plan, the structure, the system. Pep creates that. Klopp creates that. And I think it is fair to say now that Arteta is absolutely creating that. But it doesn't matter how good the system is if the talent isn't good. Within the system, individuals still must perform in high leverage moments at an exceptional level. When players are all around them and the game is moving quickly, they have to do things at a level that is elite individually. And Thomas Party did that. He operated in a congested area under immense pressure, and he ducked shoulders and gave body feints and threw players the wrong direction and touched his way out of danger and progressed the ball and carried it forward and recovered when he needed to. And it was a performance that is the level that if he can hit it consistently is best midfielder in the league level. I mean, it is, it is yet another step up. And of course it is only natural that it would be his final performance before leaving us for the AFCON, which I mean, you you can't make this stuff up, but he finally gets a run in the team without injury. And this is the apotheosis of what he has been with us and what we hoped he would be when we when we signed him. This Thomas Party is everything you could ask for. And I, I think his performance set the tone because that's the area of the pitch that you have to be able to win against City, that you have to be able to, to handle the pressure, handle this the pace of the game and the 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 congestion in there in order to in order for the rest of your players to be able to perform. And I, I think he's the catalyst for the performance. Yeah, he's one of many catalysts. I think um, 
I post COVID, I went to the preseason game against Chelsea, and he was playing this one in that game, and he got taken down by lofty cheeks from behind, and he had an eye ankle sprain, and we missed him for the first three games. Remember, we lost those three. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and for me, his importance has just been obvious. Um, people critique his performance, but I don't think they critiqued his importance. I do have this issue around big transfer fees and how it makes people feel about certain players, but I can't change it. <laughs> so for me, I just look to the player. And there have been days when he's flattened out, without a doubt, even though he's one of my favourites, even I could see that. But I never thought it was a problem for us. I just thought it was just time, just needed time. And when these big teams rock up to your to your manner, shall I say, you've got to have people that have a certain something about them. And, and Thomas Party has that. When he stands and looks across to, to the other team, he's thinking, I'm, I'm as good as you. And they know he's as good as them. And other teams have been ganging up him for a long time. And funny enough, his mates come back in the last few weeks and, and his form's come back to, to the top again. Right, because there's someone else to take responsibility. There's someone else they have to care about. There's someone else that can do a bit, distract and attract people. Uh, I'm not always his biggest fan, but you can't deny it. When they play, I say it from the start of the season, those two are our best partnership, most experienced partnership. Now the centre-backs are pushing them close, shall I say, but if you looked at us at the start of the year, those are the two you had to get near to stop Arsenal moving. Right, So I think he's a wonderful player. I've worried about his mobility and his fitness, but that's all I worried about. When he's fit, this is what you get. And um, there is, in that position, you've got Fabinho, you've got Rodri, that get a lot of kudos. Obviously, Kante is a very special player. But Partey, for me, is right up there with them all when he plays like that. And that's what we need to push his team on, right? So, and he gave that performance and and more. And I just hope now, I know you're you're right to say what you want, Elliot. You know, some people are not just you are saying we need to do that every week. Now it's not possible to do that every week, but it is oh, no, possible. You can't hope. do that every week <laughs> <Because> <laughs> no that, was, that was incredible, right? But yeah. it is possible that he can play with a level of bravery now, which maybe was he was losing a little bit when his form dipped. That his confidence should be high. And if his confidence is high, he's going to play well. Every pass won't stick, but he'll play well. And so, yeah, so we got the player that we all thought we were going to get, and we got him on the biggest day, and that's that's a great reward. Yeah, and it's funny, right? Because like, I don't even know why we argue or debate about Granit Xhaka, for example. We know who the player is. He's a good player. I think most of us would agree. The next level in our process, for example, the next step in, in going where we want to go, we need a striker. We probably need an upgrade on Xhaka. And that's not to say he's not good. He is good. It's a ceiling. It's a ceiling on our performance. The reason I think we debated and argued about party a little bit is we were learning about this player, and I think we saw an absolutely elite, dominant-type central midfielder in there, and we saw head-scratching performances along the way that made us say, where is the guy we know is in there? And over the last couple of weeks, with a run in the side, without injury, without being in and out of the team, guess what? There he is. And Can I say one does, last no thing, Elliot? Just yep. one last thing, just mm-hmm. for a tactical discussion, really. Uh, yeah. I've never been sure about Party as a single pivot. I'm not sure if he was a single pivot in this game. I think Shaka does a thing where he's next to him, but then he goes higher up on the left as well, yeah. so he plays almost like two roles. But if there's a day when a single pivot was going to work, it was maybe against the other team that plays a single pivot. Does you know what I mean? And it's all about your midfield as a group. And so... I'm still to be convinced he's a single pivot in a in a four three three, shall we say? But he's still. He, I'm absolutely convinced he's the main man at the centre of the the wagon wheel. Do you know what I mean? I think he's the guy that should be there, and how we surround him is to be confirmed and to be debated. But he gave that wonderful single pivot performance in this game for me. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, before we move on to other performances and and moments in the game that I think are worth breaking down. I mean, Paul, I, I do think that the reason I say that he was the catalyst is, is not that there weren't other great performances. There clearly were. But I think that area of the pitch, especially against Man City, is an area where we've been dominated in the past and failed to compete, failed to win the duels, failed to get out of trouble. A- a- and that's where all the problems start, right? When you lose the ball there or can't access that space, and so everything has to go out to the fullbacks, who, by the way, were also excellent in this game, like basically everybody. But so... It, and I'm not even praising Party to create or draw a contrast with Shaka. I'm praising him purely because I think he deserves it. But it was 
really eye-opening to see us thrive, not just be able to access midfield in one of these kind of games, but thrive there and and dominate there. I think Odegaard deserves credit too for linking that and and his use of distances with party to create those linkages. Like I just, I think that was a big change. So maybe it doesn't have to be a, a specific discussion of party, but in general, I mean, do you find that now being able to to win the competition in midfield is a big shift from what we've seen over a couple of seasons? Yeah, I think, there's a I, I mentioned it before I think there's a good balance there and Odegaard is weaving in there and you got three players that uh, are developing a real understanding among themselves um Chak is a, a kind of an interesting balance to what's going on there um and he gives party that outlet the simpler outlet to his left when he needs it and Odegaard and others are buzzing around, making angles. And when party's on, man, like he nutmegs Silva in the middle of the park, I think it is, in this game. And you're like, holy shit, he's feeling it. And not for no reason. It gets him upfield. He gets a pass out to Martinelli, I think, if I remember the play right. Um, and that kind of stuff just breaks you open. Um, and it gives the other team second and third thoughts before they get too carried away pressing you all over the pitch. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. There's the, the Amy's interview. Amy Lawrence does the interview with Chaka on The Athletic. And there's a really interesting paragraph or two when Chaka is talking about party and how difficult he's found at adjusting two things over here with the, you know, adjusting generally. And then you got the injuries and the stop start stuff. And the pressure from being the fifty million pound mid midfielder, um, it just tells you like this stuff does does get to them. You you know you kind of feel you got one high hand or two hands tied behind your back if you're party and you're getting the injuries and you're in and you're out and you're not you're just getting to the level you want to be at. Um, and it's interesting as well the kind of maybe you can read too much in, into these things, but the protective relationship. Chaka has with Party, um, like just the way he talks about Party, that's a partnership, um, and it'll be interesting to uh, to see how it develops. As you said, off he goes to Afcon again, and here we go again. And he comes, he'll come back in uh, hopefully a couple of weeks, but maybe it's three, four weeks, and we start again. And hopefully he's in form. I think if those guys. Uh, with Odegaard, have the time to play together without injury, we're going to see a really impressive midfield that we can build on Who's who's got the cam, got the chill, finds the players on the break as we transition against these bigger teams. I think they're going to do really well of teams in and around their own level and they're going to bash teams at a lower level and therefore I think something has clicked. The only... I said before, something's clicked. It can also unclick, and I think the thing that unclicks it if you if you start losing a few key players for whatever reasons, and you like some of the core aspects of if you want to call this it the spine, but the spine of our play out from the back and our build up, you lose some of those players. Um, you kind of feel like you're starting again. If we if we can keep these guys fit and healthy and moving forward. Um, I think that's a midfield that's going to bash people. I don't think we should get so worried about when one player has a... Like, we've had games recently where Chaka has looked the business and parties looked pretty quiet. But I don't think you're going to get a game where both uh, pivots are lighting it up on the ball. I mean, that's that's probably not even desirable. And I think sometimes I think we should just kind of leave that to the two guys on the day. Let when one of them's feeling it or the ball's falling his way or the angles are suiting him and he's lighting it up. And certainly this was absolutely eye catching from party. Then I thought, you know, the other guys around him were absolutely fine and kept it steady and let him do it. It's like Chaka or party's having his day. Let him go for it as long as he can yeah. go. And we'll fill in around him and we'll cover. And like Party got forward too and Chaka would drop back or 
Uh, you know, Tommy Asu would pull into the midfield and provide a little cover. They're, they're beginning to find the patterns throughout the game to support the play so that we can maintain it even against City in the midfield and in the final third. So we're not always coming back to step one, playing out from the back and having to do it the hard way the whole time. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. The thing that I think is interesting to me, and maybe I didn't realize this so much, but like Party is a small space player. He's not really a runner, right? He's not really... He's not a sprinter. He's not going to cover big swaths of the pitch to you know, with recovery runs and things like that. And while I don't think Shaq is a small space player, he he is also not, you know, from an athletic profile, a runner. And and maybe the, the next step in midfield is to have someone in there who is a little more sprinty, who can yeah. recover, who can cover more of those big spaces. Because, Go yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Edith. I just want to add a bit more on that, actually. And I thought about this and why was party so much more easy to spot on the day? Um, well, I think the way we approached this game, and I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised Paul hasn't said it, actually, was far more front-footed and far more up the pitch, shall we say, right, from a toothpaste perspective. Toothpaste, and so, yeah. Definitely, and we, were, there, yeah. we were definitely more aggressive in everything we did. And, and Party is a is a front-footed player. He wants to go and get it. So he does, he reads the press, he reads the pressure, and then he reads the next phase really, really well. And then once he gets it, the game retained really good. He can get out of pressure that comes to him, the counter press, and then keeps it moving. So we see that open space. We see that really, really easily. Where Shaq has a bit, he had to, he was forced to play a back foot game in this game. And so maybe we don't see him so much. So he's not getting the passing on the front foot. So he's passing numbers away down. So he's playing the back foot game. And a back foot game leaves him isolated in situations that we don't really like. Do you see what I mean? Which don't suit his game. But he maybe had to sacrifice his game to allow us for party to be so aggressive. And then he would sweep around and cover gaps from people who have gone on to go and get the game for us and win the game for us. I think we would have a... I wish we had scored two goals in the first half. Because I think they would have... We, we deserved it. And I think it would have shown a complete performance on the day. And uh, what I love to see sometimes are when players sacrifice themselves and say, this isn't my day for my normal game. I'm prepared to do what what the team needs for us to be successful. And I felt we were massively aggressive in this game. But when you're aggressive and you're playing a team that's better than you, what generally happens is when you do get the ball, your quality is not very high because you spent so long trying to get it and you're blowing and you lose it quickly. You can't get to those first three passes as you heard me speak about earlier, but we got to those mm. first three passes so well with such design, with such composure into those wide areas in behind the city fullbacks, forcing them to think about their position, breaking them in for a two at the back to make them to a three at the back, which means they couldn't support him midfield enough. Which meant we have spaces for party, which we, then we can see him. Odegaard fancies it, and we suddenly we're all over them. And because we're prepared to take the risk to go and get people, stand next to people, win the duels, but now we've got the quality. to say, oh, now we've got the ball. We're going to show you what we can do. And that was the me, thing for me that brought the excitement. The excitement was, oh, my God, we're not playing them like an FA Cup tie. You know, we're, we're playing them for real. This is real. We're playing football. We're doing, we're playing the Arsenal way against the best team with no compromise, zero compromise, zero fear, and a lot of quality. And that, that feeling, I can hear, I can feel it almost coming back to me right now. That feeling is what I want to walk away with. And we must grab onto that as a team, as a club, as a fan base, because that's what is what we can do. You know, if we must show no fear, don't do the Everton crap, the main United crap. Compare those performances. I, don't, I, I just want to really raise them from my brain. They were full of fear, playing in the wrong areas, worried about the crowd. Crap. Get after these teams. You, you are that good. You know, don't fear them. Step onto them. And suddenly we're seeing players deliver because they believe in what's actually happening. And, yeah. um, that feeling, mate, it could stay with me. I hope it, I hope it stays with me past Thursday. It was a great feeling, wasn't it? Yeah, you know what it is? It's what what rewards are you trying to get? What what accomplishments are you shooting for? Because the way we played against Men City and the way we've been playing up the pitch, pressing, you know, more front-footed, when that works, that can take you to the highest level of the game. The other way of playing, sure, it can still win you a game. But I don't think it can take you to the mountaintop. Now, I think it is fair to say that everything is a process. Here we go with trust the process. 
And it is only, we are only able to play more front footed now because look at how much more compact and intelligent we are when we lose the ball and not giving things away. And a lot of that is partnerships. Tomiyasu, White, Gabriel, Tierney. Brilliant on the day. You take one piece out in Gabriel, you replace it with holding, you lose a second ball, you're slow to react and recover, and you lose it in, in stoppage time. So absolutely, I, I want to get to a couple young players who I, I think really can take us to the very top of the game. But you know, first, we haven't actually talked about our New Year's at all. And Paul, I'll just ask you quickly, did you make it to midnight on New Year's? Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? Well, like, did you watch the ball drop, you know? Oh, no, I don't. No, I I panned New Year's. Uh, mm, I, fair enough. I Yeah, well, you had to be up early for, for the game. I, so I did watch the ball drop, and you know what I noticed about it as yeah. I watched? There's no hair on it. <laughs> no hair at all. <laughs> maybe, maybe the most famous ball Shit, in the world, why didn't and there's I? no hair on it at all. So if the most famous ball in the world doesn't have any hair on it, why do you? This is the question. This is what we ask ourselves, and this is why we wish you a Happy New Year's from our friends over at Manscaped. So, I- I've done the ball joke. Let me just say, go to manscaped.com, use promo code ArsenalVision, get 20% off and free shipping. Uh, I-, I don't usually read the copy they give me, but sometimes it is so uh, extraordinary. Sometimes it, 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 it just manages to reach a level that, that requires it to be read. So here you go. A six-pack is a great New Year's resolution. But how about a six-pack for your balls with the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 containing six essential tools for ultimate below-the-waist grooming? I don't know. I don't know where they come up with this. But, yeah, that, that has really um, elevated itself, I have to say. Look, the Performance Package comes with Lawnmower 4.0. We've talked about it. It is the absolute... Uh, best product I've ever used for this. It has skin-safe technology. You can use it in the shower. The battery life lasts, you know, crazy long, and it has just the contact charger. There's the um, deodorant, moisturizer, toner, spray. Um, It's all in there. They give you their shed travel bag to keep all the goodies stored and comfortable, so you definitely want to do that. Uh, There's also their refined cologne, which is uh, vegan, cruelty-free, dye-free, paraben-free, all that. So go to manscaped.com, use promo code ARSENALVISION. You get 20% off in free shipping, and you can get the Performance Package 4.0 with all their best products uh, shipped to you for free globally. So that's great news, and if I must say so myself, I think probably a great um, a great segue. But we're also segueing into January, which means the transfer window is open. And if you don't have players on the field with the right skills, whether it's breakaway speed or elite playmaking ability, you're going to have a tough time winning. The same goes for your business. And Indeed is a fast, simple way to make sure you're hiring MVPs, most valuable players. It's a little American-oriented, I guess, in its in its writing. Uh, yeah, if you're hiring, you need Indeed because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. It's the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality candidates that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites, hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner to help you do it all. I mean, maybe this is how we get our striker. I'm just saying. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. Indeed makes it easy to hire great talent. According to Comscore, Indeed is the number one job site in the world. So, start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash, huh, Blue Wire, it says here. Really? Wouldn't it be Arsenal Vision? Uh, You know, it says Blue Wire, use Blue Wire. I don't know. I'll find out from the guys what they want me to do. But for now, use Blue Wire. The offer is valid through March 31st. Go to Indeed.com slash Blue Wire to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Indeed.com slash Blue Wire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Clive, is that enough of that? More than. Let's go. More than. I agree. Let's go. Let's get on to it. So, uh, I don't know. Who who who, who talked last? Clive no, did. I, right? I did. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, Paul, you talked about the nonsense of the ball dropping and stuff, so, so I'm, I'm not going to rule you out for that. All right, it's time for you to make me happy. Let's play Make Elliot Happy. Let's praise Gabriel Martinelli for a while. Um, it's interesting because in the wake of this game, I was sort of surprised to see some frustration with him. Some people in my mentions saying, oh, he could have slid in Odegaard a couple times. He could, you know, he had some chances to assist people. He misses the open net. And I think these things are true. But I also think that focusing on those things 
is really missing the forest through the trees of an explosive performance that on another day is the kind of performance that has Madrid bidding $100 million this window. Um, he takes five shots of our seven shots in this game. Four of them are inside the box, and the one that isn't is the curler that just misses the angle. You know, sometimes the collective, Paul, is how you are good, and sometimes the individual is how you are good. Aaron Ramsdale hits a stunning pass into the attacking half onto Martinelli's foot on the run. He never breaks stride. He never has. He controls it on the run. First touch, kills it dead. Away he goes. Skins Cancelo for like the 80th time in the match and creates a chance for himself. The one that flashes just wide of the far post is unlucky. The one where he lets the second man come in to, to help defend and still gets the shot off, that one was close. That's the one where I think he missed the chance to put in Odegaard because the, the, the first one that flashes by the post, I think he has every right to take that one. Um, but he was just roasting you know, one of the best fullbacks in world football over and over again. Easy to forget the kid is, you know, 20 years old. I don't think he's played even a thousand minutes or 1500 minutes of Premier League football to take five shots against Manchester City, who I don't think they allow five shots on average in a game. Uh, he's just, he's just sensational. And I thought his threat in pushing them back and scaring Cancelo meant that Cancelo couldn't have his way with us in terms of wanting to push up and be a part of their buildup. So, for me, again, much like Party, I think what he did created a dynamic that let us be more front-footed. And I think we should, instead of focusing on the couple of things that didn't come off for him, I think we should marvel at what did. And I realize he misses the open net, and that is a moment. Look, it has to be laid at his feet. You need to score there. I think Atwell gets in his way. He hits the post. I think he's slightly unlucky. The whole game turns on that moment. But still, Paul, I mean, this is a virtuoso performance that's just missing the final little bit. Yeah. You know, on the misses, you see top-level strikers, Ronaldo, right, who's still an absolutely brilliant finisher, missing open goals like that. Because however simple it seems to us, and, like, don't get me wrong, he, he should, air quotes, score. Um, like, half the time, the best level, the best strikers in the world miss those shots. They just do. Um, how often is the XG above 50%, do you reckon, for, for a goal? I mean, it's so it's, I mean, very rare. I mean, rare, I think a big right? chance usually is something that's going to be around, you know, a 30% chance or a 25% yeah. chance. This know? is on his left foot. Uh, he's, you know, he's not expecting it, which doesn't seem like... Do you think Atwell good. makes it more difficult? I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think what it is is that he, instead of being able to take the straight line to the ball, he has to run around him to get to it. And that extra yeah. half second matters, you know. It does matter. It it also mentally it 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 confirms the idea that like it, that you're not expecting something to fall your way. Like there's another, you know, the referee referees between you and the ball. This is going out for a corner or something. And the next thing it drops to you on your left foot, you have to hit it first time into this huge open net only it doesn't feel huge and open <laughs> it feels tiny and postage stamp sized that's why these guys miss more than 50 percent of the time no matter who they are ronaldo anybody else on his wrong foot at, at that angle under those circumstances it's at best 50 50 um and yeah he he should have scored there um the ones where he should have squared it, I mean, I'm like, Jesus Christ, um, what you want is guys taking, this guy's a shot monster. And don't get me wrong, I see the pass he could have put in for Saka, for Odegaard. It's just, that's not how football works. Are we new around here? Like, it's great when you do that. On the other hand, like, it's almost after the fact that you can say the right thing to do in most of these situations is to pass. Or when they pass, the right thing they sh to do in this situation is to shoot. Like, you just go with your gut feel. And, you like, if you're Martinelli, you're, you're, you're saying to yourself, if I get a, a decent look at it, I'm going to shoot. You, you, you don't go in. It's not shopping for cereal. Uh, in the grocery market where you're confused by choice. You have made your decision not when you're about to touch the ball, probably two, three strides beforehand, before the situation has fully evolved, you've picked your course. And if you're not sure, you say, I'm gonna let I'm gonna go for it, I'm gonna leather it. And a stride or two later, just as you're hitting the ball, oh look, sack is open or oh, that's not how it works. You don't 
hit the pause button and you say, oh, hang on, there's a better option to my left. I'll just change everything in my, my mentality in a quantum moment and I'll just squirt. Like it's just, that's that's watching it on TV does that. Um, yeah. At least that's my view. I, I think we think they have all sorts of choices when in fact they're they're basically their body shape like just think how often you say oh he got his body shape wrong well how do you get your body shape right by having a, a thought about what you're about to do and then two strides later bang you hit well, it well can, can i make another quick point there is also sure. that like in order for your body shape to be wrong when you're striking it into the open net, you know what you had to do? You had to be first to be aware to it, have incredible explosiveness to get to it, right? I mean, like, the thing that I think we often fail to rate highly enough about elite players is how hard it is to get into good shooting positions inside the box. Yeah. And that have the players picture. that do that the most yeah. are the best players in the world, you know? Yeah, and they have a picture of how things are going to unfold. But guess what? It's not actually the picture of the future. It's just a pretty good map to get them to yeah. a great yeah. position where they think they're about to get a shot. And lo and behold, Saka just happens to have drifted into a spot to their right and they're supposed to make that. Like, it's just, we ask a lot of these guys. And sure, his decision-making will get better and smarter. But I, as Ronaldo's decision-making got better and smarter, I still don't see him passing anybody else. So I wouldn't well, hold your breath. That- He's a shot monster. Um, like he's getting into brilliant situations that that one where he spins a wide past the keeper and it's just a foot off the one where he gets around I think that's the Cancelo one the curler against the post I mean he's getting closer and closer I say let him go for it he's he's building he's layering his confidence he's narrowing his targets like the one thing we have been is shot shy and this guy's a yep. shot monster he'll get four and we have a five, shot shy six. striker right yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the other thing, you know? So yeah. you need a, so, sh- a uh, shot monster f- wide forward. Yeah. yeah, and strikers have a certainty about them. They know they're going to go for it unless it's not on. They back themselves, even though somebody else is in a little bit better uh, situation. That's what you see in, in great strikers. They're going to go for it, so. Yeah, well, yeah, I agree. Uh, Clive, I, I want to ask you for, for yeah, sorry, fin- uh, Paul? Yeah, I know, go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Look, I'm not in my usual no, setup. Everything's a little off. You. There's like beeping no, and no. screaming in the background. No, I insist. Um, uh, Clive, quickly on the individual moments. Uh, do you have any frustration with Martinelli on any of the individual moments? The, the open goal miss is hard to swallow. And in the moment, I was pretty upset watching it back. I think he's a little unlucky. And I think he does brilliantly to sort of be alive to the opportunity and 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 accelerate to it. There are people that feel he should have picked out Odegaard on, on his other options, where uh, other moments where he took shots. I'm much less critical of that. Look, you always want players to do the best possible thing that can lead to a goal, but just the fact that he passes it to Odegaard in those moments doesn't mean that Odegaard will necessarily score. And certainly in the first instance... Or that he gets the pass just right. Right, Right, exactly. I mean, you still have to execute. I think, um, you know, what, what goal was it? It was, there was a goal we just scored in another game. It's a... I think it's a sack of goal where he's where Martinelli's on the run and slides a pass on the run over to I think Lacazette, who then plays it out to Saka on the right. And it, you know, it's a brilliant on the run pass. He he had an assist at Old Trafford, I think, uh, to Odegaard to score um an equalizer. So it's not like he won't pass. I, I think don't know, you Clive. described the first Norwich goal. Uh, Nor- yeah, that's the one. So uh, Clive, I mean, look, the player's still learning and he will get better about decision making, but to come away with anything from this game other than, I think, just the eye-catching brilliance of Martinelli, and we, we will, of course, come on to sack in a moment, I think would be a mistake. So do you do you have any any frustrations with, with the individual moments, or are you just generally sort of thrilled nah. by what you're seeing? I, no. We've got two 20-year-olds on the outside of our pitch that we were a few months a few months ago, I mean short months ago, um, Sacco was just developing into that right-hand role. Martelli was nowhere near the team. We had a three hundred thousand pound a week centre forward, and he was our main forward presence. Now we talk about two twenty-year-olds running behind a hundred million pounds worth of fullback talent on the opposition, and according to the Manchester City uh, online world today, they were deeply concerned about <laughs> the speed of Martinelli and Saka, <laughs> and and they are worried about the quality of their fullbacks when Carl Walker's not in the building. 
And I mean, that's how things can change so quickly for Cheeky you. Cheeky bid for Cancelo, lad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's how, that is how quickly things change. So I was worried about, you know, where do we get our Ford presents from? We are talking about kids, basically. That's what we talk about. And they have just gone against the best there is and absolutely ripped them. So I'm not remotely concerned about the small details of 20-year-olds. Crikey, when I get the details right, I'm more concerned about have we got enough money in the bank to keep them. You know, that's going to be, I mean, Marte signed a longer contract. Um, Saka smartly got two years to go in the summer. I'm sure he'll stay. I hope he'll stay. I don't see any reason why he wouldn't. And days like the weekend, the, the biggest thing for me, Elliot, the biggest thing for me is that the world is watching. And if you're a young player with an agent... And you're thinking, you know what, that Arsenal Football Club is not dead. It's yeah. alive. And this is where I want my player to go because they're going to play him. The crowd is fantastic. The, the manager's young and progressive. They're playing positive, modern football. I want my player to go there. That's what that is, this is all I've wanted for this moment to come. That's Very why I was so angry. Than it was 18 months ago, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I was so angry about the, the, the game being ripped away from us because. We only saw a 55-minute game. The rest was attack versus defence. It was a training drill until we finally cracked and the centre-backs were too far apart and we couldn't close the gap quickly enough. It was so disappointing we didn't get to see the whole game that we could really judge this game properly, the analytics around it, properly judge this game as a whole and everyone can see exactly where we are. But if you're watching this as a young player around Europe today, you're thinking, yeah, I fancy some of this. You know, well, why wouldn't I? And that's that's, you know that's a sign of a rebuild. Is, on top of all that, the type of football we're playing is the most modern, sophisticated style of football. Like, yeah. this isn't, uh, I'm not knocking Leicester City, City, they're brilliant. And I'm not knocking Brendan Rodgers, he's a really good coach. But we're playing far more sophisticated. We're, the ambition of the style of football we're trying to play is the top level, right? Top. It's positional play, it's total football. We're asking the most of our players and our style. It looks terrible when it doesn't work because <laughs> it's a f- sophisticated style of play. And so if you're a young player, uh, you're not just go- going to want all of the things you've talked about of the like the good club, the good environment, the, the young players getting played, the progress. It, it's a bit like acquiring skills in the workplace if you're a software programmer. You're going to want to work on the exciting projects that are using the latest, latest technologies and tools. So if you're the next Martinelli, you're saying, that's actually, you know, this is the kind of football I want to learn, understand. I want a coach who can tell me the things. I want the guru who can tell me how to play this kind of football. I got skills, but how do I play in an integrated fashion in a sophisticated team so that I'm the kind of of talent out there that the clubs are seeking when I'm 25, 26, because I have learned the skills. I have, if you like, the football resume of how to play at that level, and it's proven. And I think that's. I think you hit on something there. It's really exciting for a, for young players to to not just see the glitter of Saka and Martinelli. Uh, the, the other thing I'd add on Martinelli is. One of the things I liked about him was he had those misses and he didn't look in the slightest phased, right? It's not, there was no agonizing, there's no beating himself up, slapping his head. There's kind of that wry smile. That's a guy with a deep underlying confidence that he's, he's arriving. That you know who you can contrast it with? Like, think about yeah. Alex Awobi. Every time Alex Awobi yeah. missed a shot, I, I thought he needed therapy. Yeah. You remember, like, he would look stupid, so crushed. Stupid, Alex. Stupid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, he was, like, beating himself up. And, like, Martinelli just looks like, well, I'm going to get three more of these in this game, and I'm going to put one of them in the back of yep. the net. I, it, Clive, also, I think from a dynamic standpoint, the – the inability of teams to be able to key on either flank because you have Saka on one side and Martinelli on the other. I, I think that that does matter, right? Because if all you were to do was say, well, we'll shut down Saka and the guy on the left isn't a goal scorer, isn't a threat. Like you have different types of threats, but both are equally potent. And I think that makes us very difficult to defend, especially when Odegaard's floating into the left half space and Lacazette's, you know, over on the left, uh, pardon me, Odegaard's floating into the right, Lacazette's floating into the left with Tierney overlapping. There's, there's no easy solution on either flank now. No. So yeah, you know, you know my my principles. I, I like pace on the exterior. I like brains on the interior, and mm. and that's what we have now. And um, 
So, and that's why we can push up from the back. We've got Pacey center banks. We've got Pacey full banks. So the exterior, the outside of your moat is covered. But when we're, when we're going forward, we can attack from out to in. I mean, Theo Walker will love this team, right? You attack from out to in and you drive. It's not where you start, where you start from is where you end up. And so the central zone is something that's actually you play through, you bounce off of, and you use it for phases. You don't always use that as the point of the arrow, not in the way that we're playing at the moment. And that could change, right? Um, so what we're seeing on the exterior now with these two sprinters, I'd like to see one more, if I'm honest with you, because they can't play every minute of every game. And and I'd like to see a bit more rotation of the brains in the interior. You know, I, I wouldn't have been against Smith Rowe starting this game. I will, I will say that honestly. I thought it was a punchy game, a more off-the-ball game. I think he would have been really well suited. And I, thought, I think I saw for the first time a bit of sadness that he wasn't starting in this game by the way he played when he came on. And um, Yeah, it wasn't the best sub performance, but again, it's against, you know, it's with down to 10 men against. Yeah, Manchester it's very City. tough. I just felt that I, I, he's been really, really good. And he's taken the fact that he's, he got an injury and he's out of the team for four or five games. And you couldn't tell that he, you know, he scored every game, so he wasn't bothered. But it's the first time I saw a little bit of sadness at the end of the game. I just thought, mm, maybe he, he's, he needs to play now. And maybe he would have played midweek against Wolves. But he's he got three to, games coming up that are all yeah. good candidates for him. He to needs play to play before the trip to Spurs. Yeah, no drama here. I mean, what I'm trying to, well, I just want to finish off and say, we look like a club where people want to be at, and that's good, right? We have some housekeeping to do, like we always have to do. The squad looks like a place we want to be at. We weren't the place a few months ago. That Aston Villa felt we were so vulnerable they could be 25 million pounds for Emil Smith Rowe. And that's what that's what we were to the outside world back then. Think about that. That's where we were. And that's how vulnerable we were. That's what people thought the atmosphere was like in our club. But now it's yeah. completely turned around and um we go onwards and upwards. You can you can always tell who the great players are too, because they get the roughest treatment. And like Martinelli and Saka. I mean, Saka's been kicked pillow to post for about a, a year and a half now. Martinelli got that weird two footed challenge that I don't think it's a red because it's a slip. But it's something. Rosary, <laughs> it's, wasn't it's it? reckless. Yeah, and I mean, because the, the thing is, people can say, "Oh, I got the ball." Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the point. What happened to the whole idea that it's not about whether you get the ball? Like, if I go flying in with my studs at chest height and don't get you, and you know, my butt gets the ball, like that's not a fair. He's challenge. endangered to player. So, He's endangered to player. Yeah, He's that's out, exactly. Slightly it. out of control. It wasn't meant it's out of control. But you know what? The referee has to mark that. You don't mark it with a corner. <laughs> that's what you don't do. <laughs> well, so it doesn't matter what is meant, right? I mean, again, I, I've never understood the whole he meant it, he didn't mean it thing because, you know, I, I may not mean to break your ankle with a very poor challenge that's too reckless and forceful, but the fact that I did it puts you in danger. Yeah, I, anyway, I they think the fact that they're getting that treatment, that. though, yeah. yeah, the fact they're getting that treatment tells you a little bit about them. And now it's time, the one downside of young players, I don't think referees protect players who don't have the reputation yet the way they protect other players and our young players need to be protected and all of us as Arsenal fans have gone through the pain of young players who weren't properly protected and had careers ruined so let's not have that happen I will say uh, Paul tell me if I'm crazy the the Bukayo Saka goal it's a brilliant run from Saka and it's well taken I don't think the pass is for him I think it's for Odegaard and it's behind him (laughs) I really do. I think because Odegaard makes a really intelligent darting run through the middle, and I think it's a really intelligent spot to try to pick him out. But I don't think the pass gets to him. But because Sack is making such an intelligent run too, he just luckily arrives at the place to get the ball and, and pass it in the net. It's brilliant from Saka. I don't think the pass is intended though. Yeah, well, that's where the that's where the craft and the genius is. You know, where's the trick in the pass going to the player you meant and him putting it in the net? Uh, yeah, no, I think. Saka just reads that situation uh, really well. And that's the beauty of it. I don't think the keeper quite sees that coming because Saka's... It also allows Saka to get more power on it because he can move towards the ball. He's got the right angle. Uh, He kind of passes it in, cushions it in. But because of the angle the ball comes to him, there's plenty of power on it. Goalkeeper is nowhere close. I almost feel like the goalkeeper got his angles wrong. But then you would if you were watching the wrong player. Um, so yeah, Tierney bangs it in. He sees Lacazette. He knows what to do. Hit it to the center center forward, and Saka nips in and and puts it in the back of the net. But the movement's really good. I think isn't that the one that comes up through party? And it's just yeah. it's just really good play from from kind of deep midfield up and across and like 
it's almost embarrassing for City when you look at the goal. It's so, in some ways, it's so simple. And you're like, that was easy. We should just keep doing that. And, and like, uh, I think City will look at that and think, holy shit, how did they do that? We just carved <laughs> them open, right? Yeah. They looked so unsophisticated. And we just absolutely open them up. And like, I do think there's this emergent property. Like we have a system we're playing. We have these players, they're good. And then it all goes up a level. Something has clicked and it's not this guy clicked and that guy clicked and this other guy clicked. It's like, it all happens together. It all goes up a level. And you see it, like when you see Liverpool at their best or City at their best, you're like, holy crap, what is that? And like, it just comes up a level as a team, as a group. There's an expectation of who's going to do what and players play in the in their upper range of their abilities at the same time. Um, <clears throat> and long may it continue, yeah. but it feels yeah, like well, we've got sure. a new base baseline, a base level, as long as we can keep these core players fit and healthy and playing. I think to what, if you're looking for the click, you, for me, there was a level of control off the ball and there was a level of control on yeah. the ball. And I think if you're looking yeah. to try to summarize it, I think that's it. Aggressive position, good starting position, playing in the right areas and controlling more aspects of the game for longer periods than we have in the past. That doesn't mean we're going to have unbelievable possession stats because when I looked at them, I thought, oh my God, was, was that the truth? And this is why the 10 yeah. men thing really bothers me because... We and I, I'm starting to learn about data, and I saw Matt stuff in the Discord. By the way, oh my goodness, brilliant! And I'm starting to learn about the data, and I don't think this is the game that data can really be a true judgment of because it was two games because somebody shat himself in the middle of the pitch and didn't referee the game properly, and that bothers me, you know. But I'm still getting over that. But we were robbed of something that we could really, really analyze and say, okay, where are we? Did we show oh, we're going to rewatch it half? and do that, Clive. <laughs> don't, don't <laughs> yeah, you worry. Did, did we show like, three in the second half? I, I, I tweeted yeah. something out at the start of the second half. I said, are we waiting for the next big thing to happen to us? Or are we going to make the next big thing happen for us? And I was really intrigued to see what would happen. In the end, it happened against us, but we were unlucky to make it go for us. And then obviously the game was taken away with 10 men. So there's still a step for us to go yet, despite and how we ten feel. men, we, we played proper football real football we went yeah, we, we went for it and i think the reason the possession stats don't reflect how you felt how you and i felt about the game is that when we were when we didn't have the ball it's not that we had fallen back we were still engaged it was still a battle back and forward we were kind of it wasn't us in our box we were engaging oh. them kind of to <laughs> Near no, I, under, I understand line. why. I understand yeah. why, Paul. I understand totally why. But if we eleven v eleven, we'd, we could have we'd have a good look and see what was it. We could see look at the game properly as a as a data exercise, not just how we feel, and to see how we manage those moments of adversity eleven v eleven, so we could judge them a bit more acutely. I felt there was still there's still a step for this team. There is uh, there's a step to make sure we don't derail in big moments and we handle pressure better. There's a step still. But I feel more confident about that step, funny enough, after this game, because I think they've found out something about themselves. And the the things to fix are real quick. They're like, okay, lads, can we calm down a little bit? You know what I mean? It's that, it's that quick. But can we still do the same things the next game and put people under pressure well, and execute? Simple as that. Well, and to be clear, like one of the reasons I don't think the possession stats matter that much is until the red card, the overwhelming amount of City's possession is in their own half with yeah. us engaging and competing. I just use as an example here. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to no, do that. Right. No, but where we were, is, we controlled the, right. we control that game right. off the ball and on the ball. That's what I mean. And, yes. I, and I've not seen that for a long time. You know, I'm, I'm, Because if you look at any city pass map or any city, you know, like like passing data from most of their games, it's not just that they dominate possession. It's that they've got the ball right on the edge of your attacking third or in your attacking third most of the game. And that was well, not I the case Well, I think it's here. a really interesting example of how you can still control a game with your shape without necessarily having the yeah, ball. And well said. That, yeah, exactly. That's why it felt an extremely balanced game. They, City weren't playing where they wanted to play. Exactly. I, I, I want to get to one other thing, though, that I think it would be a shame not to talk about. Now, Clive, I'll start with you on this. Is just that we see the way going from Pepe and Aubameyang and Lacazette up front to 
Saka and Lacazette and Martinelli up front changes the dynamic of the attack there. And we see the way adding Odegaard, you know, instead of, let's say, like a Willian or whoever the heck you want to say, you know, changes the dynamic there. And Shaka coming back, you know, whether you're frustrated with what he did on the penalty or not, and I have to admit I'm in the frustrated basket. His partnership with Party certainly appears to work in such a way that we're getting more out of that area of the pitch. But the partnership at the back, it cannot be praised highly enough. The Gabriel Ben White partnership, Ramsdale at the back, the fullbacks, and the player who probably somehow misses out on being celebrated enough because it's quiet brilliance and not flashy brilliance is Tomiyasu. And if you wanted to make an argument that he's the best signing we made this summer, I don't think it's a leap. I think he's in good company because the fact that that would be a debate shows you how well we did. But his quiet brilliance is not celebrated enough. And I thought this game was quietly a masterpiece because not only was he brilliant defensively, but we were playing more up the pitch and he was a big part of that. And he looked very comfortable doing it. He showed his two-footedness. He was good in tight areas, you know, 90% of the time. And, you know, he he kept Sterling mostly in check, a player that's very hard to deal with isolated one-on-one. I, I just think that it, at some point, you got to stop and praise a guy who isn't flashy enough to get it most podcasts, but but deserves it almost every game. Yeah. So for me, I've already said he's a sign of the summer for us. <laughs> I've actually said those very words. And the reason yeah. why, because I believe very strongly in stability. Because everything we've spoken about, about where we played, we can't do that with our last year's back four. We, we can't. We, we didn't do it in the Man City game. When we didn't have these players playing in the Man City game, I think we had Marie holding, and I'm not sure who played right back. It might be Chambers, actually. We might play the back five, but we didn't have these players playing in that game. And so we can't be aggressive. We can't go and get people. We can't go and intercept. Okay, that aggression costs us a red card potentially, but, you know, I'd rather die doing the right thing, right? So, and, and when you do miss your ball, you, you've got people who can win races going back. And so you can play on the halfway line. I mean, Liverpool showed us exactly what to do. Their team transformed when Van Dyke came in. He couldn't run them. He couldn't run them. They'd go two and two at the back. Good luck. And they overload you everywhere else. And um, so, and I know that people didn't like some of the critiques of, of Bellerin last year, but it was for this very thing. I feel stability is really important. Most teams detected it on their left. Your right back has got to be able to defend. He has got to. And Raheem Sterling is one of my favourite players. And he got Bosch, mate. He got Bosch. He was looking for the ball everywhere else but where he should be. He didn't know where to go. He couldn't. He, Tommy was tight on him. He was right on him. He couldn't turn. When he tried to turn, he, were, he was fighting him in his space, fighting him and battling him. So when, when he got out, he has never had a chance to get his head up because someone else would come over. So he delayed him when he didn't when he didn't take the ball off him. He delayed him, which is one of your five defensive principles. He made sure he had to work for every single yard, and he was fit enough to stay with him. So he didn't run out of steam. He imposed himself at all parts of the game. A perfect fullback performance, classic fullback performance. And we don't we don't look in that area anymore. We don't look there. We we're, we look we're looking elsewhere for the fixes and the upgrades. You know, that's done. Now we're thinking, okay, how can we backfill him? What's, what sort of player do we need so he can sit on his ass every now and again? Because since he's arrived, he's barely missed a minute, right? So um, he is transformational to our team because I think he makes Ben White better. He makes Saka better. His distribution is clean. I, I can predict it. He's two-footed. He's aggressive. He's got the right size, the right speed. He's got he's got the lot, mate. And the only player I rate more than him as a right back is a guy that was on the bench for them in Carl Walker, and he's 31. This kid's 22, just arrived, learning about our game, learning about our country, learning about the grounds he's going to. He'll he'll do for me, absolutely. And yeah, we're very, very, very good signing. Yeah, yeah. Paul, I don't want to uh, obviously cut you out of getting a chance to to praise him because I do think let's just be honest, there are going to be a lot of episodes where we don't talk much about this player. And that is unfortunate because every episode you probably could have something said, but this game, the challenge he faced defensively while also being asked to help us play further up the pitch, which let's, let's be clear when we signed him, you know, Clive and I did a scouting video and I saw the defender in there and was very, very impressed by that defender. I did not see a player who would play in the attacking half with the confidence and comfort level that he has been and did in this game. And that, to me, 
you have to have that in a fullback in this, you know, in, in this modern football era. When we were building with the three, two, five, and and he was staying back with the line of three, we knew he could do that. Now we're building with more of a two, three, five, and he's joining the attack and he's not struggling. Yeah. Um it, it's when a player comes in like that, it gives you an education as to <laughs> as to what's required in a position. And it's like, you just don't realize how short of what you need in that position you were. Um, he's been phenomenal. Um, I, I think w- what I really like about him is uh, I get the sense he always knows, he he builds up the pitch in terms of how he integrates into the play. And we've, all, we've generally done that on the right-hand side. When Chambers was good for us, we'd see him kind of slowly moving up on the right and and knowing when to join into the play and support the play up the pitch. Um, and Tamiyasu got that almost immediately what his role was. And now as we, the team, progresses up the pitch, I think he's just coming with it. And he'll, he'll do that kind of tucked in, full back in midfield. He just makes us so secure on that side. Like, they just got nothing down that side. Sterling had to go to the... Like, if you remember that really good um, cross they put in uh, early on that skimmed off, I, I don't know whose head it was, um, and they they kind of uh, threatened our far post. It was a really nice header early on. That was Sterling over on the right-hand side, wandering around the midfield, trying to find something useful to do so that he could feel a player again. I mean, he'd just given up on the left-hand side. And they had to. I mean, they just weren't going to get anywhere. And his size, his frame, um, the heft he brings, his speed, uh, but mentally knowing where to be at all times defensively. And then he's just layering the attacking piece of, of it on top of it. Bologna weren't a particularly attacking team. So it was hard to judge uh, in, in the scouting review, what he could really do there. Um, and if we like, we should remember he's got some subtle moments to him. Like it's, it's his ch- for the Martinelli goal, whatever number of games back, the one o- that comes over his shoulder that he puts in the back of the net. That's, that's a deft chip from Tommy Asu. So I just think, again, mm-hmm. it's kind of an emergent thing in the team. When the team's playing well, you, these players start playing in the top level of their range. And it's exciting to see him as an attacking threat too. Yeah, well, we are all going to carry the joy of how we played in this game along with the sadness and rage of how it was taken from us. And the question becomes whether it means everything or nothing, or somewhere in between. And complicating that is the fact that we now go into three cup ties before we play again in the league in a North London derby. I'd love to be playing Spurs with the team we put out against City this weekend. I mean, obviously, Gabriel wouldn't be available, so that would stink. But you get my point. Like, if we could play, you know, three days later, having played City that way at Spurs, I think we win, and we win handsomely. But that's not the case, Clive. And so, just as a final point, how do you think Arteta should manage the fact that we have three cup ties before the next league fixture and the unfortunate reality that we now lose players, you know, really most notably, most importantly, Thomas Party of the AFCON. What do you what do you think is the right way? Because I would be perfectly fine with rotation for all three cup ties with an eye towards being fresh and ready for Spurs, but that would actually be quite a long time where you'd be letting some of this, you know, I hate to use the word momentum, but let's use momentum of the way we're playing potentially fade. So how should he how should he manage that run? Yeah, so I thought it's one of the other podcasts. I think um I would go pretty strong on Thursday. We're at home. I mean I just checked the website. There is not one single ticket available on Thursday. And there is not one single ticket on ticket exchange. It's completely sold out. Zero. Right. So that means the crowd's going to be bombing. Right. So so I'd go pretty strong on Thursday. I'd rotate a lot more for Sunday, which is Forest Away. And and then I would have a semi strong team for the Liverpool game, knowing that on the Thursday, knowing that you've got five subs and you can do what you like, bring on the first game's result. And then on the Sunday, obviously, if Spurs, you got you got the energy for the, uh, the Spurs game. So that's how I would do it. Liverpool, I think they play Shrewsbury as an FA Cup game. So I'd imagine they'd do the same thing. The big difference for them is we lose Party and Pepe and Abamyang, but they lose um, Salah and Mane. 
and they are their forward identity. So it's going to be interesting to see how they adapt to that. Obviously, these games have used their backup players or they use them off the bench, those two superstars. They can't use them. So I think it's a good opportunity for us to get to a final. But I must admit, the league game is everything. You know, the league is everything. I think we've got an opportunity to shortcut this project and get into the top four this year. And the schedule is our friend. So how we use that is really important. And I think... Um, it's important he gets rotation right in this couple of weeks and gets gets lucky with injury as well, which is um, key key for us. Yeah, and look, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that Emil Smith Rowe should come back in for these games. I mean, he's done nothing wrong, so to speak, to lose his place. I personally think, and maybe not everyone will agree, that Martinelli has been better. And if you want to say, how come we're scoring so many goals, creating so many chances, and pressing so high up the pitch so effectively, I don't think you can look past Martinelli, not because Smith Rowe isn't great. You unfortunately, fortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, have two excellent young players that, for the time being, occupy the same space in the starting 11. And I'd stick with Martinelli, for example, for the trip to Spurs. But there's no reason not to give Smith Rowe these games, or at least two of the three. Um, I think against Forrest, we can definitely heavily rotate. You don't want to get knocked out of the FA Cup, but again, you got to pick your places to, to rotate. The player, Paul, that we can finish with touching on is. The one who I think has to come in Thursday because he's theoretically going to be a big part of things is Lakanga. It does look like Maitland Niles might be off to Roma. Interesting, given that we could probably use having him around through January, at least a couple weeks of January, because of our central midfield situation. El Neni gone, Party gone, it leaves Shaka, it leaves Lakanga, and then makeshift players like an Odegaard dropping in there or Smith Rowe dropping in there. So do you think Lakanga is one who comes in for Thursday and has to get a, you know, a decent run out over the next couple of weeks because I, I would imagine he's going to be starting with Granit Xhaka uh, at Spurs on the 16th. Yeah, I can't I can't see any scenario that isn't Lukonga and uh, Xhaka as our midfield over the next few games. And he should play all the games, all the minutes, or at least as far as the physios say he should, or the 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 sports the sports medicine guys. Um, those guys need to bed in. Um, obviously he's a right footer. He'll be taking over from party. So it'll be interesting to see, does Lakanga do the hub role or does Chaka do that? But I guess that'll evolve or be made clear to us soon enough. So I think, um, definitely Lakanga's going to play all the mid the minutes that, that his fitness allows. Obviously he's, he should be pretty fit. He had the COVID, uh, hopefully he's a hundred percent now, but he hasn't, after a good run of games at the start of the season, he hasn't actually played much or for a while, so or at all. So match fitness and the speed of the game. So maybe it's sixty minutes in his first game, but after that, it's it's ninety minutes, um, and uh, it'll be interesting. Like he's a really good player. Uh, he's quality, and. He just needs to get a little bigger. It'll be like a, I wonder if it's uh, by next season we're like, holy shit, that guy's filled out, because um, <clears throat> he's he's an absolute talent, and I think he's pretty confident in himself. So, um, it'll be interesting to see how he does in the North London London Derby because I guess pretty much that's our vulnerability. If he can step up and and provide the sauce that parties just provided then we're in great shape yeah look i mean we we there's some things we can't predict because obviously like it could be frankie de Jong and and erling holland in the team when we face spurs so you know that that that's always a possibility you should keep alive i joke but like with the window open there's there's that added element of uncertainty about incomings and outgoings i mean maybe we sort of find a way to use Maitland Niles once or twice before he goes or I, I don't I don't know I mean it it, it doesn't look like that's so going to happen He seems so far from the team though though doesn't yeah, he yes, even yes. if he's around it's like he he's mentally out cuz he's looking for the move and he's mentally out cuz he just hasn't I mean he's has he been in lineups on the bench very often no, not really No He's just no, not part of it. He's on the bench of the weekend, wasn't he? Towards. He's on the bench of the weekend. Yeah. And he was yeah. he was doing his smiley thing at the end of the game. So let's wait and see, right? Austin says he's potentially been there's an offer been made. A Roma wanna nail it down now. 
as they would do, because they know that we need him. <laughs> and uh, I also have yet to respond. So up in the air. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. All right, we can leave it there. That's a, a good long one, and we've got more to cover. There's going to be transfer content coming up. Uh, a lot of it, uh, scouting videos will be returning over on the Patreon side. We'll have um, the City Rewatch over on the Patreon side. And for those of you who have signed up over there, we love you and we, we really appreciate it. But I also understand that's not for everyone or not possible for everyone. And so our goal is always to make sure that we you know, get you a, a couple of hopefully good, but at least long <laughs> podcasts every week. That, that <laughs> Yeah, and, and free podcasts if you can tolerate the, uh, the Manscaped reads. And just know that, you know, we love you. We wish you a very happy new year again and, and hope that you can see the, the positive side of an encouraging performance rather than be consumed entirely by the understandable rage at the refereeing. But that is the yin and yang of being a football fan. Let's leave it there. Pause on Twitter. Pause my pants. Thanks, pause. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Smith, the Black Man Twitter, Yankee Gunner. We love you. We'll talk to you after Arsenal 10, Liverpool News.